Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Alicia Madonna. I am an artist, instructor, hair and skincare consultant, motivator, and brand new host to this series with your current host, John Morris. John, how are you today? I am doing fantastic. It is a freezing cold day here in Scotland and it is absolutely <laughs> pouring it down. Um, my hands are covered in paint, folks, because we've been repurposing the cabinets next door. So please don't think that I'm unclean and I just haven't had a wash. It is the artistic nature, as, as uh, Alicia will tell you, um, to be covered in paint. But I'm having a fantastic day. It's been an amazing weekend launching our teen life coaching course. Um, we had so much fun with that and the kids already are starting to uh, to grow about their own self-image and I know we're going to talk about that a lot in the show today and there's just so much awesome stuff that's going on so I'm really excited but how are you doing today? I'm great I'm actually coming off of a pretty crazy weekend as well but I feel like we're swapping weather because it's sunny and gorgeous here this weekend so <laughs> yeah. You've got rain I'll, I'll all week. I'm actually weekend. back in my big woolly jumper because it's so cold <laughs> over here. It's like eight degrees over here. So it's really cold today. Certain parts of Scotland are actually getting snow at the moment. That doesn't surprise me. Well, I mean, we had snow a few weeks ago here. So yeah, we just threw it your way. <laughs> <laughs> I always forget you guys are in Celsius. I'm like, eight, yes, right. Eight degrees. <laughs> yeah, whatever it is, when someone says to me, you know, what, what is that in Celsius? I'm like, cold. Very, very cold. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah, we I had a crazy weekend, went to a wedding. Um, it's my first weekend or well, first going into the first week, uh, not employed with the employer that I've been with for two and a half years. So it's, it's the crazy and exciting time right now. How so. are you coping with that just now when, in, in this position? Because I've been there as we talked a, bit, a little bit about off air. How are you coping with this now? Um, right now, I'm just trying to take each moment as they come I, I feel like I, I start thinking ahead I start thinking yeah. about this weekend next weekend next week and that's where my panic starts setting in and I'm just yeah. like you know what we're gonna focus on this moment and what I have to do next and I'm just gonna focus on that or else I will drive myself crazy um but that is kind of a, a perfect segue right into what we do. So um we both want to welcome you guys to this show. Um it's something unlike anything else. Um, it's a show that focuses on teenagers, uh, the struggles that they face, the battles that they deal with, and um, how that kind of drags on into uh, your adult years well after your teen years. Um, so we're here to help you guys out and we're, we want to get from where they are in life now to where they want to be. Each week we're going to tackle three topics um, in 30 minutes. So let's begin with the first one. Are you ready, John? I am super ready and well done you folks. I've just got to say Alicia's first <laughs> time doing an intro there. That was mega awesome. Well done you. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Do a little <laughs> bow. <laughs> um, okay. So last week we talked about um, teen self-image and, and how that kind of um, changes as you go from your teen years into your adult years. Um, I just wanted to kind of expand on that a little bit more. Um, so I think I'm just going to jump right into my first question. So have you reached a point in, in your life where you're questioning everything and you desperately need a change in your life's journey? Have you hit that wall before? For me, yes, absolutely. Um, and I think it's important as well. I know we were talking about this a little bit before to notice what's going on in your surroundings, notice what's working, notice what isn't. That's how we learn lessons. And I think that's what today's show is really going to be about is observing those lessons. Um, you know, but absolutely. I mean, th there are times, you know, it, it's, it's all about seasons in life. And we cover this on another show uh, called Going Deeper, where it's all about the season times and, and winter times are season times and winter's like, I can't figure this out. My money's gone. What do I do? All of that kind of stuff. And that's OK. That will happen because then comes spring and spring obviously always follows winter. It's a great place to put it. If you're going to put it somewhere, it makes sense. Um, but it's like the tide that goes out one day. It clicks in your brain when you're least expecting it. And you're like, wow, I actually figured that out. That makes a whole lot of sense. And then you start to build your plan together. How about yourself? Have you reached that stage before? Actually, I am I'm currently going through it right now, which it's I think is why I wanted, <laughs> Yeah, I think it's why I wanted to talk about it. Yep. Um, especially since I am actually in my later 20s yep. now. Um, I feel like a lot of the time people kind of expect you to really have it all figured out 
by now. Um, and I, I, something I actually was just talking to my mom about this this weekend and, and some of my cousins, cause they're a little bit older, um, their generation, the people that are in their forties, fifties and, and beyond, um, it's a very different young yeah. life that we live now than what they did. I mean, my mom had all three of us by mm -hmm. the time she was 29 and she was working and, and being a mom and I am nowhere near ready for, <laughs> for that. And so I think it's hard when you have these influences in your life that are doing things a certain way they, they've been doing things the yep. way their parents did it. And now all of a sudden there's this big shift. And I even feel like there's another shift happening mm -hmm. just from my age to kids that are 17, 18, 19 right now, they're going through completely different things than I even went through so I feel like it's important for young adults to know that like even in your later 20s even in your in your 30s 40s and beyond there's you're, you're gonna hit moments in your life where you kind of have to take a step back rethink some stuff mm -hmm. and it's okay to kind of have to take a step back and not know where life is going to take you next and, and I just think that we're driven home that we need to know what we need to do we need to have it all figured out so that we can just coast the rest of your life and I just don't think that is a re if it was a reality before it's definitely not a reality anymore um and I just want I want people to be aware of that and it's okay <laughs> I completely agree. And one of the thoughts that came to my mind there was uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, he was a, a, one of the great thinkers from the past, and he wrote a book called Nature. Now, to some people, it may seem really far out there and really weird. But one of the things that he talked about that jumped into my mind there was, you know, throughout history, our ancestors have had their own way of developing their faith and developing their work and developing, you know, cultures and things like that. And he asked the question, why shouldn't we be able to find our own way of faith and spirituality and, and the way that we want to do business and the way that we work? Um, and I completely agree with you, Alicia, that I think there is an expectation that it will all just happen. Um, and one of the, the teachings that I was taught years ago was it's like giving a child a dollar or a pound if you're in the United Kingdom. And they said, well, have fun. You're only young once. And the problem is, you know, when you tell a child, well, go and spend the dollar, and you're only young once, well, where does that end? Because, you know, we've got children over here in their 30s and 40s that are still spending the whole dollar, that still say, well, I'm only young once, it's fine, that, you know, it doesn't matter, live today as if it were your last, and living today as if you were last is fine if you're only going to live today, but if you're alive tomorrow, then you're going to be thinking <laughs> ahead, and, you know, it's not just going to happen, um, and like I say, I mean, th there is the expectation that things will just happen, but it's not true. You know, it only happens by us choosing it to happen. Um, and I think, you know, there is that disconnect now that seems to be in school, because again, certainly when I was a child, I, I, I just finished or, or the, the age you just finished for your apprenticeships. So if you went to be a builder or a plumber or electrician, you were given a trade that you could learn, you could go into, and that was your job. If you were going to be a banker, the chances are your father and his father and his father's father was a banker, so on and so on and so on. Nowadays, it's not because the, the world has changed, the economy has shifted, and it's important to be able to know um, that, hey, if you're reaching 16, 17, 18, 20, 30, 40 years old, you know, you can still make a shift. And I want to talk a little bit about that later on in terms of the importance of getting clear um, about that, because there's, there's some really awesome teaching about it. Um, but, you know, so that's really my perspective. What do you think about it? So I wanted, so something that you mentioned about the, about trades yeah. um, and, and kind of the economy of the world now, um, I don't know how it is out there in the UK, but I know here um, in the States, we don't put a big emphasis on trade jobs. And oftentimes they're actually kind of given this like stigma of like, oh, you're yeah. doing that, okay. But we're, we're actually hitting kind of a crisis point where we are gonna not have trade workers mm -hmm. very quickly. and. Um, I think it's almost this kind of counter of like, you know, we go after what our parents go after and we want to 
just do what they do so that we can just be successful, mm-hmm. have a good life and move on. But I feel like there's a bit of this, at least here of like, don't be like me, do better, do more. And I think that feeds so much into this like anxiety of, yeah. okay, I have to get my, I have to get my stuff figured out. I can't just be a plumber like my dad and be fine. He wants me to go to college and become a lawyer or whatever it mm-hmm. is. And having gone through college myself, it's really not for everybody. And I feel like that's a whole big component of this, like figuring out who you are and where your life is going to go. And especially here in the States, it's just, it's almost like you just go to college, you just go because that's just what's expected. And then you figure it out afterwards. And it's like, we're doing so many kids a disservice by just shoving them into college racking up an absurd yeah. an absurd amount of student loan debt yeah. and then they get out and they're like I didn't I don't even want to do this like mm-hmm. this isn't even what I wanted and I do think it all kind of goes back into this like this is what you're expected to do you got to do this to be successful and then it, it really kind of almost sets kids off their track a little bit I think it's really interesting because, again, as, as I, I watch the markets globally, and folks, if you don't know that I do work, uh, I'm a professional artist, among other things, but I, I have clients from all over the place, networks, et cetera, et cetera. And I notice the difference in Australia to the United Kingdom to the United States. And that is one of the things that actually we've been talking about a lot, is the fact that so many kids and teenagers, adults, whatever, will go and try and get an education, go and get the education, finish with in the states it's actually between twenty thousand and a hundred thousand dollars worth in debt now when i saw these statistics i was like we need to do something serious about this um sometimes more than that (laughs) but but that's the insane thing um (laughs) and and they finished their education the same over here maybe got twenty five thousand dollars or twenty five thousand pounds worth so maybe thirty five thousand dollars whatever it is converting um finish their education go through four to ten years worth of education and then not be able to get a job at the end Now, to me, there is something severely wrong about this. And Donald Miller, um, who wrote, I know we were talking about this last week, he wrote a book and it's called Building a Story Brand. And this is a book here, you can get it out. In fact, we'll put it up um, as an affiliate link and you guys can check this book out. If I was gonna recommend any book at all for anybody to get, it's this book here. Why? Because it will teach you how to market, how to sell yourself, how to um, promote anything that you do and almost ensure that you will always, always be able to find work. Now, that book alone is available for $15, okay? So you have saved nearly $100,000 just there and the likelihood of you getting a job is 95% more depending obviously what you're going into than anything else. Over here, we have uh, trades and professionals because they will always have work. You're always gonna need an electrician. You're always gonna need a plumber and a you know gas works person. Um, but obviously in the States, culturally, it's looked down upon, even though that's one of the biggest professions that there is. And um, I think, you know, certainly from what I'm hearing in the States, the pressure there on failure and you know well what about if you do this and I, and I know obviously we've got this in our show notes um, that we'll go over you know it, it's it's so intense and it adds to so much anxiety and so many people stressed out and it's like guys first of all we need to take a breath you need to figure out for yourself what you need to do with your own life and you know stop trying to compare yourself to everybody else because when you do that you stop being who you are and yeah, I mean, that it's, it's, it's a whole other topic for all the time. But, you know, it's really, really important that we get this figured out. And obviously, this is what we're, you know, working to be to, to do for sure. Absolutely. Um, I think that's a pretty good segue right into your, <laughs> your topic for the day, because I'm interested to see, I don't know what John's going to throw at me today. And I'm really excited because like, like he says, this is kind of a real time thing happening. I'm I am actually going through this. I am actually going to be using everything that I learned here with with John to apply in my life right now. So see, this is the perks of working with us because Alicia's essentially <laughs> getting life coaching skills here. You guys are getting life coaching skills. And this is something that you are not going to find in a school or a university or a college. It doesn't exist, folks, and certainly not in the United Kingdom. I've been I've been in school. I've done I'm on my third bachelor's i've had a master's and yes this is all brand new so 
<laughs> You'd but, think at some point I would have learned it, but no. <laughs> but, but this this is the problem. Again, the fundamentals aren't taught. And I want to touch on one thing before we move on. Um, because one of the questions that we have in our show notes, folks, um, is was there ever a time in my career that I hit a wall and realized I needed to recalibrate and redirect myself? What did I do? How do I go about? The reason I bring that question up in particular is because it's the final part. How did I handle feelings of failure? Okay. And, and we're going to do this backwards and forwards as well. So one of the lessons that I teach over and over and over again, because it is actually so much of a valued lesson to me. I'm actually, Alicia, I'm actually working on two brand new books right now. Really? Yeah, I'm working on two brand new books. And one of them is actually called We Never Fail, We Just Produce Results. I started working on it on Sunday. And it was That's just beautiful. one of those things I was like, wow, this is incredible. But it's true. We never fail at anything. This is what you've got to get clear in your mind. I'll be known for this. Wayne Dyer is actually the one that taught me this, but I want, to be, I want to be known for it. But we never fail at anything. We just produce results. So for example, he uses the analogy, if a golfer places a golf ball on a tee and it dribbles off to the side, you know, he hasn't failed. He's just produced a result. So next time, you know, he places the golf ball on the tee, make sure there's no wind or anything blowing and he hits that golf ball and hopefully it goes exactly where it's meant to. He's produced a result. It's the same with the artist that wants to try and paint a mountain and they end up painting a hill or they end up painting a polar bear. They haven't failed at painting a mountain. They've just learned how to paint a polar bear. What you do with the results is up to you. And when you can actually look at these things and say, okay, well, I've tried it this way. I've tried it that way. I've tried it the other way. Emerson did this. It's a popular thing. Um, you know, Emerson tried 999 times, I believe, to make a light bulb. He only needed one way that was going to work. That's the same for you guys. Once you actually figure out, you know, you only need to, you only need to be successful one time. You know, you just got to figure out how to do it. And once you can figure that out, it's incredible. Now, I know this now, I'm now 33. As a teenager, I didn't know this. And for a long time, I didn't know this. Um, so for me, when I was a teenager and I was like, oh my goodness, I, I, you know, that didn't work out. And this didn't work out. And man, that sucks. And we, we've got a great product in, you know, art courses, but no one's buying them. And we do this, that, and the other. Well, that didn't mean that, you know, I failed in putting these things together. I just need to learn and acquire the information on how to put these things into practice to make them work. Remember, everything that we do is like putting together a piece of a puzzle or a jigsaw or a clock or whatever it might be. It's not going to work until you've got all the components there. Um, and it's, it's really, really important to have that. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. It's actually something that um, I, I, I recently kind of become aware of yeah. because like you said, throughout so much of our lives, we're not really taught that it's, it's not alert. You know, they kind of, they kind of talk about it in yeah. a grander gesture of like, Oh, you know, it's a learning experience, but um, it really, it, you have to shift your mindset from failure to, okay, that didn't work. What's, what's the new way? What's the adjustment? One of the things that I actually learned, I've just got this highlight just before we move on to this, folks, if mm -hmm. I can give you know, two pieces of wisdom. So the second one is this, don't hold on to things too tightly. I found when I was holding on, there was a certain project that I was trying to accomplish last year, and it was just so big, like you need an entire film crew to be able to do this. And I'm trying to do it all myself. And I was just like, this just isn't working. When I released it, you know, into the universe, into divine hands, whatever you want to call it, into God's hands, I was just like, I felt so much more at peace because when I was letting things flow, things naturally was occurring. When you try to hold on to them really tightly, it doesn't. And it doesn't work as well when we're trying to force them. So those are some little tidbits and things there. Um, have you anything that you want to add to that before I move on? <laughs> <laughs> um yes i do have show notes on. <laughs> <laughs> go for it um i do yeah i think i just want to like heart like just talk a little bit more about that of like you know it is a it's a mind shift yeah um from from yeah what did i do wrong to to like how can i just make this better next time um See, Honestly. Alicia, actually, what you did there, now, this is something, folks, to pay attention to here. Alicia asked the same question, but she asked one that the majority of people ask, and she asked one that was a wise question. Rather than saying, well, why did this happen to me? It's, how can I learn from this to make sure the damn thing doesn't happen again? 
you know, or, but that's the wise question. A lot of people say, well, why did this happen to me? Why did he do this to me? Why did he do this? All these questions, me, 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 as opposed to really developed thinking questions. We've got a, a world, folks, of people that really don't know how to think a problem through. Google is not the answer. You know, <laughs> you've got to be able to think. <laughs> You know, and we're developing a world of people that just do not think. Sorry, I'm I'm going off on. No, you're fire fine. <laughs> no, you're fine. I was just gonna say, you know, it's it's kind of a humbling experience, and you almost have to, you just really have to be like receptive yeah. to it. You you can't like go into being like, oh yeah, I, I, you know, I got it figured out, like whatever. You really have to be willing to like kind of self evaluate a little yeah. bit and be like, yeah, okay, I I messed up that mm -hmm. that wasn't the right way of doing it how can i how can i improve so it definitely takes a certain amount of like humbleness yeah. and a little bit of um looking into yourself self-reflecting being really honest mm -hmm. with yourself sometimes which i know is is honestly the one of the hardest things to do because you know you can lie to everybody else but at the end of the day you really can't lie to yourself um and so i, I love what you said about not holding on to things because I feel like for so long that's what I did yeah. and and not just with failures but like with every tiny little mm -hmm. thing that I thought I did wrong in a day whether it be I looked at that person the wrong way and they looked at me wrong and I'm gonna I'm just gonna carry that around with uh -huh. me now all day long and <clears throat> there's a lot of like ways of there's like ways of meditating there's ways of just taking a second at the end of your day and just really like push it out into the universe and be like it's not here anymore it's the end of the day tomorrow's a new one I can put all of that off to the side and tomorrow's going to be a brand new day. don't forget about everything that happened because if you forget then you're going to do it again but you know just let it go and be ready to take on that experience again but with a different lens and a different viewpoint and a different way of doing it. Absolutely. And and there's just a couple of things that I just thought of there, you know, as, as time goes on. First of all, we choose our thoughts. We actually choose how we respond to situations. You know, we can choose to, you know, respond in a really positive way or we can choose to, you know, go in a negative way. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, as, as artists and that artistic mind, sometimes we have the tendency to overthink things. And I did this for years with everything um, because I was so concerned on how I appeared to other people. And I know we talk about that later in today's show, um, but I was, and it was literally because I had people around me. I'd surrounded myself with people who, if you made one slight error or anything, they would pick you up on it. So you said this in when you were preaching a sermon, I didn't like that. And then you change your entire life to try and fit into this person's mold and perception of what they think you should be. Um, and again, it, you know, true love means, you know, I can be who I am, you can be who you are without a fear of you need to conform to my will because, mm -hmm. you know, that's what I expect. And I need to conform to your will. But that's what I was doing for so long. And then when I figured out, hey, it's okay, some people are not going to align with my spirit, I can send them love and I can move on. I don't need to hold on to this. And we hold we, we choose what thoughts we hold on to and what thoughts we release. And the final thing I was just going to throw out is this, um, because I, I do feel someone needs to hear this today, that the the amateur is the person who makes a mistake and that mistake defines them for the rest of their life. The professional and the expert, whatever you want to call it, is the person who makes a mistake and very quickly adjusts their path and moves on. And when you can do that, that's how winning is done. That's, I mean, if you, if you ever watch Rocky Balboa, that's how winning is done. You know, you got to take the hits, you got to take the punches, you got to, you know, and life will literally beat you to your knees. I have been there. Alicia's been there. Folks that are watching this have been there. And it will literally pound the snot out of you if you let it. But it's being yeah. able to adjust, being able to deal with things. And I find now with the life changes that I've gone through and the very peaceful life changes that I go through now, I let things flow to me, through me, and past me if I don't want to hold on to them. So yeah. that's that's my little tidbits there. <laughs> that actually is very powerful. Um, and it's so, so true. And I think the more that I go through life, the more that I am realizing that that is so true. And yeah, so if anything is taken away, 
from this episode today. I feel like that's that's it right there. <laughs> so that's, uh, but that's so empowering for me because you know it's like yes, you know it, it's it's because you can say this in your own head and it sounds good. You can say this to other people and like oh yeah, that's good. But when you get someone that really con clicks and connects with it, it's like yeah. yes. <laughs> I'm so I mean kind of as an example I won't spend too long on it but like that actually happened to me last week in the last week of my job you know I I had to take all the punches I had to it was terrifying you know I yeah. was leaving them in some ways kind of high and dry on, on a lot of things but it was realizing that I was being taken advantage of for my skill set and and being that professional to go okay I messed up this time I need to just continue on and and adjust and keep going yeah. um but it actually ended up working out pretty well for me I don't know if I if I mentioned this to you yet but they they're freelancing me now wow <laughs> so I'm actually getting paid <laughs> twice as much for the same work that I'm doing less work um but all because I pushed myself and, and knew my my self value that is incredible and this is the crazy thing as well folks i know oftentimes we want to play it safe and again we could do just an entire you know couple of hours on this quite easily and we may end up at some point doing that <laughs> but the thing is when you really get set in you know in in that position of being comfortable it's like well i get a weekly check or i get a monthly check and that's what people do and there's nothing wrong with that folks let me yeah. let me you know point that out if you've decided that for yourself and you're saying look i'm happy going to work I know what money I'm going to make I know what's going to happen I'm fine with that that's okay okay no but equally if you're sitting there saying you know what I know that I can do better I know I can be better you know my uh, again another one of my teachers uh, Mr Rowan Jim Rowan he often said you know don't wish it was actually someone that taught him this but don't wish it was easier wish you were better you know learn the skills set yourself big goals not necessarily for the money or the place or the prestige but for the person you become and already I can hear in Alicia's voice that she's like becoming and is that professional person because she's like I wasn't happy in this situation I'm taking charge of my own destiny and the fact that she did, we are now here doing this show now, and she's part of something that's phenomenal and incredible and is starting to become life-changing for so many people. Make those small changes and you're being amazed at what can actually happen. Yeah, it's definitely just like, it's that pushing yourself outside of that comfort zone. Yeah. Um, I, I've been preaching it all week because I'm just like, <laughs> so many people, they just, they stay in a yeah. situation that, and if you are happy, like you said, if you're happy with it, that's totally fine. But I know way too many people yeah. who are just not happy and it's just easier to stay comfortable. Yeah. And so it's, it's definitely that comfort zone, but yeah, the, really, if you let it happen, the universe will throw great things at you. Yes, it's, it's just, it's scary. It's very scary to get yourself to that point, but when it's you just take like being it, when willing you to take it. Yeah, but what I was going to say, when you do it for the first time, it's like, oh my goodness, we're actually doing this. When you do it for the hundredth and first time, it's like, yes, we're doing this again. Yeah. You know, when you go for building a business, you've got an idea in your mind. Don't listen to the people that are going to say, well, could you do it? Might you do it? Will you do it? Start building it. When I built Mind, Body and Soul, we talked about this before. It started out as a book idea that led to a Facebook page that led to, hey, let's put a website together. Hey, let's do a podcast. Hey, let's get a business partner, which I wasn't anticipating. Hey, let's get, you know, do this, this, and it grew and grew and grew. Four months in, we are now here in this position doing this, you know, and when you start to see all these things happen, it becomes an amazing, amazing thing. And it's just, it really is so incredible. Do you think we've covered this one enough? Do you think the folks have got the message? I think we did it. <laughs> we did the thing. I love it. And hopefully you guys have got inspired as well. And again, don't forget to comment. So um, I believe I'm taking the next stage, which guys, if you've got a pen and paper for this, and I hope that you already do and you've been taking notes, Alicia's ready for this one as well. <laughs> we covered this a little bit off air last week and we decided this is so good that it had to be included. There are two teachers that I've heard this from in different ways. And the topic for this is getting great in an interview situation. I just want you to think how many of you guys really struggle? I was going to say suck, but that's too negative. How many, Alicia's putting that, I was going to throw this to you. How many people really struggle in an interview situation? Alicia, uh, Alicia, I'll try that again. Alicia, <laughs> slip of the tongue. How are you in an interview situation? Oh gosh, I definitely think I've gotten better. I've gotten, I've had to do quite a few in the last couple of months. Uh, I've pushed myself a little bit, but honestly, I was not taught 
how yeah. to be in an interview situation. I wasn't okay. So there were resources for me in college. I remember them. I remember it being like, y'all, everyone's like, oh, go to the career center. They'll help you out. But it's like when you're already dealing yeah. with a lot of stuff going on in your life, going to the career center to learn about how to do an interview is that not exactly top priority on you know your young mind yeah. but then you get out into the real world and they ask you that first hard question and your mind just goes completely blank <laughs> like you can prepare nine days before it up all night and that first question will come and you'll just be like uh <laughs> hold on um so one thing that I I've, I've learned, and I think this is actually the best, one of the best pieces of advice that I got for, for learning how to do interviews is take your time, yeah. like take that second. You don't have to respond like that. Yeah. They're not expecting you to. Um, and actually it kind of reflects better on you. If you take that second, yeah. think about what they ask you, but there is a lot of skills about like just your composure and, and the ways that you communicate with people that they're just it's yeah it's just not taught and I feel like I'm definitely still learning because I mean I've done several interviews and haven't gotten jobs but um, did you enjoy yeah, the I way that I conducted interviews last week what's that did you enjoy the way that I conduct interviews from what we did last week oh absolutely yes for sure it was it was it put me at ease and I and I yeah. felt like like I could answer that big question very easily. So the way that I conduct interviews, folks, especially if I knew because I want to do a run through with Alicia and the show that you saw last week was literally 15 minutes after we had met. OK, now in my <laughs> brain as, as an employer and obviously I've employed many people, um, I had a position where I was like, if I work her up and get her really, really anxious, then we try and do a show run through together. It ain't going to sound good. It ain't going to be relaxed. It ain't going to be chilled out. This is only our second time going together. You'd think we've been going for 10 years quite <laughs> easily. It clicks and it works well. So the way that I do interviews is very relaxed. I know the destination I want to get with a potential employee. Okay. A lot of folks that you are going to go for interviews with will be, well, why should I give you this job? And what can you do for me? And bang, 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 bang. Yeah. And it's true to take that breath and to just stop and to think. But the interview is actually won or lost probably as soon as you find out that the, uh, that the job role is actually in existence. Now, what I mean by that is you may look, and most people do. In fact, Alicia, how would you normally go about a job interview? So you want a job, you found this job in the paper or, or online or wherever, what would be your steps to get you to the interview? So did I get the interview and I'm- You haven't I'm, got the interview yet, no. Okay. Oh gosh, I don't even know if I have anything. I think I just hope and pray that I get it and I'll figure it out when it happens. <laughs> okay, folks, first of all, that is not the way to go about <laughs> an interview. So pens and paper at the ready, folks, because I'm going to teach ready. you something here that's liquid gold. And uh, Victor Antonio, um, sales legend, taught me this. And Earl Nightingale, phenomenal thinker, sales guy from the 1930s, 1940s, taught me this as well um, through his recordings. So the first thing that you need to do is not hope and pray for the best. The first thing you need to do, say, for example, and you can pick any company you want in the world. You could, and, and I've done this with clients before. You, you one wanted a job with Apple, one, one, one wanted a job with Tesla. Now, I know very little about Tesla, but I said, just tell me three things about Tesla. That's all I need to know as, as a coach. And he said, well, Tesla does this, this, and this. I was like, okay, right. So I'm forming in my plan really quickly. The first thing that you need to do as soon as you have seen the job advertised is to do some research. Now, they may say marketer wanted, salesperson wanted, whatever. You may sit there and say, mm, it's not really in my field of expertise, but I know I could do something about it. You're looking for a job here. Okay, so do some research about the company. Now, Apple, you know, they, their stocks go up and down, their products go up and down, their you know, customer service definitely goes up and down in terms of how they deal with people. Now, if I'm going for a job with Apple, I'm going to research the company inside and out, and I'm looking for a few specific things. I want to know how much they've made, how much they've lost financially, and where that money has gone, and what their customer service is like. I also want to know what their team is like in the area that I'm going to go work with. Now, you might think, John, what on earth has that to do with anything with regards to me getting a job 
everything. That's what it's to do. Because if you can go into an interview situation with five things, let me see if I can listen. I may get this done in four, but definitely five things. So the first thing is when you go in and you say, Mr. Apple, I'm here for, well, don't say it like that. Mr. Apple, good morning. Hello, how are you doing? <laughs> um, <laughs> they probably think, ah, straight jacket for this guy, please. But you, you say, Mr. Apple, whatever his name is or her name is. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to interview for, for this position, blah, 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 blah. You, you'll do the nice friendly chats and then it'll get down to the serious stuff, which is, Alicia, why should I give you this job? What would you say in that situation? You're going for a job with Apple. You, you, you're going for a job, maybe in a marketing position or, what, or with their organization. What would you say if I said, Alicia, why should I give you this job? So that is actually something that I have thought about in, in an interview and, and it's, it's knowing the, the skill sets that you have. And yep. it actually does go into that research component of like, where do your <clears throat> skill sets fill a hole yep. for them? And actually I'm kind of remembering a little bit of our conversation from last <laughs> week. So I'm going to plug this one in. Um, but it's finding a solution to a problem that they're having Bingo. that you that you found and that, that your skill set can, can help fill that goal because they they are they're looking to whatever job it is they want yep. you to like jump right in absolutely now this is the thing folks in the 1930s there was a major stock crash everybody in the united states was pretty much saying i need a job i need a job give me a job one person in particular said not give me a job but how can i be of service to a business that's barely hanging on now, trust me, folks, if you can go in and you can see one of these, well, all of these things, the first one is, how can I increase your um, incomings? Okay, you've got a plan on how to do it. I am going to help you increase your income. That's number one. My ears are going to prick up as soon as somebody says that. Number two, I'm going to help you decrease your outgoings. Okay, because again, if your business is losing a lot of money, a friends of mine, um, and one of them worked for a very popular uh, sports company in the 1990s. And uh, they were losing millions every single year. And they didn't care. They'd never turned a profit at all. And Eric came in and he really turned things about to make it a severely profitable company. Okay. So uh, how can I decrease your outgoings? That's the second thing you want to ask yourself and be prepared to answer. The third thing is how can I improve your customer service? And the fourth thing is, how can I fit and, and get your team going better? Now, if you're going to managerial position, that's one of the questions you need to ask. If you're going in at the bottom, maybe, it's still something you want to ask, but you're not going to have that role specifically. But there's one final thing that's absolutely crucial. So let me go through the steps again. The first one is increase your profits. Second one is decrease your outgoings. Third one is how can I increase your customer service? And the fourth one is, if you're in a managerial position, how can I get your team working better? Now, you can say all of that kind of stuff. That sounds really good, doesn't it? It sounds wonderful. But there's one crucial, crucial element that you must have in doing this, even if you only nail one of these things. Here is the plan. So if someone says to me, Mr. Morris, I'm here and I want to decrease your outgoings. Well, we have very few outgoings, but if you can increase my profits, then I'm listening. And I need to know how are you going to do this? Because you could say, well, I'm going to increase your profits. Well, you may only get me a pound more profit. I, if, if you're going to come on and I'm going to pay you 25000 a year, I want to know that you can increase my profits 10 times that. Okay, so if you're on at 25,000, we want $250,000 worth of value in our organization. Um, it, it's the approximate. So those are the things, folks. And I guarantee you, if you can see those four things, come up with a plan to really improve Apple's. It could be simple. I mean, if you improve Apple's communication and you improve Apple's customer service, then you are almost guaranteed to improve their income, which means your job is pretty much set for life. And you can go anywhere knowing these skills. Again, this is something that isn't taught, but when you know how to do this, you can get a job pretty much 95% of the time. There is a 17-year-old guy. He read uh, Building a Story Brand Business. There we go. I'll plug that again. Uh, Building a Story Brand Business. He's 17 years old. He went for a job interview with a very prestigious uh, company whose name I can't remember off the top of my head, 
but he sat down and they said to him, Mr. Smith, you know, you are 17 years old, you're severely underqualified. He says, I know I'm severely underqualified, but I figured out a way because I've researched your company, how to increase your profits, how to decrease your outgoings, how to improve your customer service and how to get your team working better. And here is the plan. They gave him the job and about $50,000 on the spot or a contract for $50,000 on the spot, 17 years old. This stuff works when you can get it. And this is the stuff we coach students, adults, families, teenagers, whatever, through all the time. And, you know, that we're beginning to coach through uh, in, in all the stuff that we're doing because it's fundamental that you know this. If you can sell and you can market, you will never, ever be out of work. So how does that sound to you, Alicia? Um, honestly, I, that's perfect because um, having gone through a couple of uh, interview processes recently, so I've been going for like, you know, social media management, communications type of positions. And a lot of the questions that they asked me is like, what would you do? Mm -hmm. How would you increase our exposure? Yep. And it, they, people, they are, they're looking for that plan. They, they want you to be ready in that yep. interview to jump in and, and be ready for the job as if, you know, you already have yep. it. Um, so I definitely know that that's something that I struggle with. It's that research component. It's that taking the time. Yeah. Um, and I think that actually is part of the reason why I, I took a step back was so that I could have this time and space to really learn that and master it because it is so important because it has come up in interviews recently and I'm realizing the importance of it. And when you really just think about like, as a business person, like that's what you need. You yeah. need somebody to come in and help make things happen. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things you can see this little clock beside me here. Now, every piece has to work together in order for the whole thing to move about. If one piece is missing, it will not move. And you are essentially a cog inside this business. You're like a cog inside a clock. Without you or without that person, it's not going to function. The other thing to remember is this, that you know, in an average day, your boss or employer or marketer or whatever it might be, will see maybe about 15 people, they will interview 15 to 25 people, depending on the organization. So you've got to be prepared, you've got to be ready, and you've got to be willing, because when you sit there and like, um, 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 first thing that goes through my head is they're not prepared, they don't know what they're talking about. If they then tell me how amazing they are, how wonderful they are, and I'm like, you know, okay, we had someone actually a couple of years ago when we were building the art school, it says, I'm a great communicator and I'm reading their CV and I'm like, hmm, interesting. There was no reflection at all. Now, this person could talk and it was a very well, you know, thought out pitch. I already knew in my mind I wasn't going to employ this person, but I, I just said to them, I said, you know, well, let me, you know, again, I threw them a curveball that wasn't what they were expecting and they couldn't hold a conversation. And I was like, okay, you're a great communicator, but you can't hold a conversation. And I just sat down with them afterwards and I did a little bit of coaching, maybe five minutes. And I said, look, these are the areas I would encourage you to work on. 19 years old, he's now gone on. He took what we went. I got a message from him a couple of weeks ago to say he's actually gone on. And that was one of the most valuable lessons that he oh. ever had the opportunity to learn was just that small thing. If you say you're a great communicator, you've got to prove it. You've got to be willing to have that, you know, oomph about you. Um, if you're a great writer, if you're a great marketer, if, and again, folks, there are a ton of great marketers out there. Marketers are basically people that tell other people what a business does or what they do. Okay, that's simple. That's what a marketer does. And they're able to put it in the right place. I have worked with several marketers before that were very expensive, that were not worth it because yeah. they could not tell other people what we did. Because at the time, we didn't even know what we did. I knew we painted, I knew we did this, but our messaging wasn't clear. And therefore, they'd come in and was just like, well, I'm going to hazard a guess. Rather than helping us trying to figure out what it was that we were doing, it was just all over the place. And that's why now if someone asks me, what's mind, body, and soul about? What's teenage life coaching about? We end teenage life suffering through step-by-step -step life coaching. Bang. That's there it. There you go. Yeah. Um, one thing I just wanted to point out about what you said <clears throat> um, was that th you gave that feedback yeah. to that person. Um that's actually something that I've actually started to do yeah. with um, past interviewers. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll reach out if I can, if it's, yeah. you know, if I have an email, if I can they say, hey, um, I'll ask them, I'll be like, what did, 
what what can I improve on? Because and that in and of itself is a very humbling thing because yeah. it, it's very easy to be like, ah, oh, they you know, they they don't deserve me, blah, whatever. But to take that step back and be like, okay, what what didn't I do? Yeah. How can I market myself better next time? Hold on. <laughs> Larry's making good friends with you. <laughs> Larry. Um and honestly, like I I don't usually get great feedback from that. And it's very unfortunate. I'm like, I'm not, you, I, you already told me you're not employing me. Yeah. I just want to know how I can be better mm -hmm. going forward. I get that people are busy. I get that it's, you know, it's kind of that like, oh gosh, you know, I have a million other things to do, but so, so valuable for us interviewee yeah. who is really trying to like do something. And yeah. just like you said, he got a job a couple months later and and even just from the little bit of feedback I have gotten back from people, it has helped. So I think the advice I would give is, you know, don't be afraid mm -hmm. to just reach out and say, hey, how can I improve? I think if you ask that kind of like yep. in every situation of life, you're always going to get good feedback and that you're always going to get something that can help you in that next step. That's awesome. And in fact, as well, it shows that professionalism. Okay, you know, you may not get the job with the company, you may not get it with Apple, Tesla, or whatever. But if you can show that professionalism and just see, you know, how, you know, what was it that, you know, needed work? Because they may spot something that you didn't equally, it, yeah. you just may not be a fit, you know, for yeah. the for the organization. You know, and it's it's that's also the other thing. It's it's making sure that you're a fit for them, they're a fit for you. There's a lot of moving parts that go into it. And that is one of the things that I always, always try to do. We don't get, you know, too many people applying, certainly at this point. I know when we talked about intern uh, programs last week uh, off air, that that's something that's kind of our five-year plan to give teenagers an opportunity to come to work, get some experience, you know, get some coaching, get some mentoring, yeah. all of that kind of stuff. Um you know, and to be able to say to them, look, this is an area that the marketplace is really looking for. Like a lot of people, you know, when, when they're going for a job, will say, well, I'm just an employee. I'm just looking for, you know, a job as opposed to saying I'm a valuable commodity on the open market. Now, what does that mean? It means basically you're trying to improve yourself all the time to make sure that your business and the business that you're working for is improving all the time because that means that you're going to be improving all the time and yeah. it means the money rolls in all the time you know <laughs> and when you do that and i know people are like why is he saying that it's like because that's going to stick with you it's an it's an earworm that's what we call mm -hmm. them you know when you do it all the time <laughs> yeah. it develops and you will be amazed at actually just that little bit of feedback and again for for us as employers it is important to be able to say to someone look you were really good at what you did, but this is an area I would work on. And it could be the age, it could be your experience, it could be connection, energy, all of that kind of stuff. So it, it's really important to, to, to have that kind of stuff. So hopefully that was helpful. Yeah, it definitely. And I think the last thing that I just want to say, and you, yeah. you kind of said it a little bit, um, is that you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing yeah. you. Like going back to that like type of workplace, yep. That's something that I have really learned in just my one, you know, in office full time job is that your team and the people that you work with, right. they, they are going to make or break a job for you. Yep. And actually, the I would have stayed at my job mm -hmm. had it just been about my coworkers. Yep. But I am starting to get into this this mindset of like when I am looking at these jobs and even if I'm to get an interview or whatever. I'll take, I'll take a look at like, what, what is our company like? Is this something that I actually want to do? Am I just applying to apply or am I really looking for a job here? And I think in, in like the rush of trying to find something to just have a job, you can kind of forget about that. Yeah. And because you don't want to end up getting the job at somewhere you don't like, and yeah. then end up just quitting anyway. Yeah. So do that to do that for yourself on the upfront interview them just as much as they are interviewing you absolutely and i think it's so important again you know and, and sometimes you know for short term you know that it is important to get a job just to get some money in sometimes mm -hmm. but then you've got to ask yourself the question is you know am i doing this short term because people do this then they get yeah. stuck 
And it's a case of don't give up on your dreams. Don't forget what it is that you're actually doing. Um, you know, there's a lot of moving parts, folks, when you're self-employed, you know, and, and obviously we've got to notice them all the time and it's difficult. But that's ultimately, you know, why we do what we do. When you're working for a company, that responsibility you hope is taken care of by the leaders, <clears throat> by the management. Um, but it's not always. I've worked for several companies, folks, in a wide variety of things. I've seen the best. I've seen the worst. And now I know how to run businesses professionally. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah, that is very, very true. And, you know, it's funny. I, I talked to a lot of my friends and we all say it. It's and it's so unfortunately true, but like 90% of the time, well, when people leave jobs, it's because of a bad boss. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. it's not the job. It's not the people they work with. Yeah. It's a boss. Yeah. And I hope, I really hope that there's a, there's a push, there's a revolution yeah. in higher management that really starts focusing on like the people. Yeah that are making things happen. Cause I just, I feel like a lot of times when you get high up in a company or you get up to high level, level management, you, you start forgetting about the people yep. <laughs> to start yeah. looking at the bottom line. It's like, yes, it's important. But like who's getting you to that bottom line. Correct. Appreciate it a little yeah. bit, but and, that's, and that's the whole thing tangent. is that, you know, the morale, you know, people think that you got to raise morale. You don't raise morale. That's stupid. Morale actually filters down from the top. And again, if you look at any business, any church, any organization, it reflects the minister, it reflects the leadership, it reflects the business owners. And when a business, quite frankly, sucks, it's usually because you've got a boss that sucks. <laughs> and when, yeah. you know, we we run an organization here at Mind, Body and Soul based on, we don't train people to be happy. We work with happy people. You know, it <laughs> makes common sense. You know, <laughs> it's not difficult. If you want to attract these things into your life, you've got to willing, you've got to be willing to find and spend a little bit of time on how do we attract happy people? Can you imagine if one of us sat there, it's like, yeah, well, I'm going to talk about how to find a job today. I'm not really bothered whether you do or you don't, but hey, you know, all the best doesn't matter to me. You wouldn't listen to that. You know? No, no. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so funny. Um, I was going to say something and it just escaped my brain. Oh yeah. I've had interviews. So kind of going back to like, you know, you have to like be present too. I've had interviews where they just are so dry. Yeah. They just jump right into the questions. And I'm just like, no, man, like I can't with this. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. But again, so. a lot of it comes down to the training of the, the leaders, the fact of are they developing themselves? You want to be in an organization where everybody, even if it's a small team, is constantly developing and improving themselves. Because if they're not, you're not going to have a lot of joy and success being there. You've got to find these things are a little bit harder to find. But when yeah. you do, man, it's incredible. Absolutely. Yeah so we kind of touched on our last point a little bit about uh changing life paths earlier um but i just i think i just want to ask you more like specifically because we, we talked about you know interviews and yep. trying to change your life path but um i guess like what would be i guess for somebody in my situation right now what would be like the next step next phase that you would suggest when kind of taking that step back recalibrating your life yeah. and going in a new direction really trying to I think still figure mm -hmm. out your self-image still and I and actually I feel like I'm really kind of going through that right now because as a designer I'm building a brand which I'm going to be getting that book very soon <laughs> um but you know they building a brand is a lot about your self image and yep. figuring out who you are and how your skills and assets and what, and what you are can, can bring to a company, to a, a freelance, to a contractor, whoever. So, yeah, I think I just want to pick your brain on, on what you would say, you know, what, what, what's the next steps? <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, I mean, th there's a lot to cover in that one. Um, would you like to cover self image first or would you like to cover more of the re realignment part first? So, Let's think. Let's let's talk a little bit about the self image part okay. because I feel like that that flows really yeah. nicely. It, it's a, it's a good starting place, I think, for um, because again, believe it or not, folks, it all starts with yourself. Yeah, 
I didn't want to be like too redundant and talking about things. I know because we talked about a little bit of this. Yeah, before, it's okay. So. It's all good. Okay. There's always new angles and everything that we can uh, approach. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> all right. So, um, I, I mean, I can go right back to like where my self image first kind of started to develop and then just kind of bring it up to, to current times. That sounds good. That yep. sound like it works? Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. I'm trying to try to go back to like my youth and <laughs> remember like what was the first time that I was like, you know, maybe that maybe that's something that I really do like. Um, gosh, you, you, you're I, young. I've got some statistics actually when you've done this bit because it will shock you. Really? Some of these things. Yes. Okay. So I actually was listening to a, a podcast this weekend and it, it's a very fun, like no heaviness to it. But one of the people they interviewed, um, she, interviews famous people and yep. she doesn't talk about anything that has anything to do with their famous lifestyle it is just about like what's one thing that you're like addicted to you know like okay. what's one thing in your life that you just love and she's found that so much of like your interests of what you carry on into your adult years is so heavily influenced yes. by your childhood mm -hmm. by the things that you experience then and there um so when I think about like my child, I, I think I had a pretty normal <clears throat> childhood. I played outside. I had friends. We had, imaginations were crazy. I very much lived in a fantasy world a lot of the times, which I definitely has influenced like my interests. I, I'm a sci-fi fanatic. Um, but then I, as I went into like, you know, my teen years, um, you know, you have these influences of like your friends and yep. And for me, having moved mid adolescence, that was it, the culture shock of it all. I think I don't I don't know if I want to say stunted mm -hmm. myself to my self image development, but I definitely think it. I think in retrospect, I think it helped because I question if I'd be the same person okay. I am now yeah. if I hadn't gone through those experiences, but. I kind of also wonder like how much farther along could I be mm -hmm. if I didn't have to like almost reset. So I kind of go back and forth between was it helpful or maybe it's, maybe it's a little combination of both. And I feel like that's more true to life is, you know, it's a combination of yeah. good and bad to kind of make you who you are. <laughs> I think absolutely. You know, it's funny over lunch today, Katie and I was talking about parallel universes and you can get, <laughs> you know, you can get on a whole different segue about that because you know, everything that we do has, it's, it's the law of transaction almost. Everything has, you know, the equal and opposite reaction and, uh, you know, everything that's there. But we wouldn't be who the people that we are now had we not done and gone through what mm -hmm. we've gone through. So, Yeah, absolutely. I, like, I, actually, I was, I was literally talking about this this weekend with my cousins, because um, my sister, actually, she's, she's very outgoing in social situations, but she's, it's hard for her to get herself into them. Like yeah. she won't just reach out to a friend. And I was talking to my, my mom and my cousins about that. And I told her, I was like, honestly, mom, like a lot of the reason that I feel like I can just kind of reach out and have a conversation with people is because you pushed me yeah. to do that. When we moved to Texas, uh -huh. when I had, to, when I had no friends, when I had to figure it out. Um, and I really feel like those, those skills that I learned there in that moment, have definitely influenced my path that I've taken in yeah. life and like and actually I feel like I'm just now at 27 realizing the things that I learned went through as a young adult and how those things really are so pivotal important yeah. to who I am and there's a million other people out there that are dealing with it and it's it's not talked about yeah <laughs> but I, it's, I agree. it's interesting to get to this point mm -hmm in life where like you think you know you think you know you think you know and then everything like shifts yeah and it almost kind of falls into place i i want i, I think i want like your viewpoint opinion on it <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> interesting this might, might surprise you actually because i had you know one of these uh you, you know I, I love how you say you had a normal childhood i, I don't even know what that <laughs> looks like i really I know don't. <laughs> I had a very bizarre childhood. I had a very, um, I guess you'd say a very loving mother, but I had a, a, you know, a mother that was really overprotective. So I didn't socialize with people like at all, aside from school, um, which can be, you know, and again, my mother literally, if I can sum it up in some way, um, 
<laughs> my mom literally wanted to wrap me in cotton wool and protect me with every fiber of her being. But that meant that you didn't socialize really with kids after school. You didn't have sleepovers. You didn't have play dates. You didn't have any of that stuff. So that meant when you, when I was going into school and even when I moved up to Scotland and when I was going through, um, you know, into certain situations and you're expected to know this, it's the same thing we talked about earlier on, the expectation that you would just know this and it would just happen. I didn't have that. And, you know, it was a long, long time. We're talking like into my mid to late twenties by the time I really learned how to socialize with people. And also where I am now, because now I just, I don't worry about anything. I don't care. I'm not bothered. I'm completely at peace with what's going on because I've made those changes in my own life. And again, you may not be comfortable in certain situations, but if you turn it into a study, you can actually figure out how to be comfortable in those situations. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it was the most weird and bizarre thing. And it really does impact you. You know, from the ages of three onwards, we begin to become socially aware. We begin to, you know, become aware of our body image and how we look. And, it, you know, these are the statistics that are out there. Easy for me to say. Um, you know, and then when you reach teenage years, you become very aware of it because your body is going through a million and one changes really rapidly. And I used to say to youth groups, I was like, guys, when you reach puberty, you're going to go through a million and one changes really, really quickly. And you're going to, you know, develop these challenges, these issues, all these things. Your adulthood is basically going to be spent figuring out and recovering from your puberty year of your, from your puberty years. Um, and they're like, how do you know this? And I'm like, because I'm still recovering from it now, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's true. It's where we learn how to socialize. It's where we learn how to, you know, be around people, what kind of people we want to be around. And, and I mean, that's a whole nother topic, you know, the willingness, but what I'm finding at the moment is the almost insane levels that human beings are willing to go to, to have their fundamental needs met. Every one of us have several fundamental needs and that's, you know, appreciation and, and acceptance and, you know, and, and the list goes on and on and on. And if one of those needs isn't met, people, even adults are literally willing to go into insane levels to try and get those needs met. And, you know, it's the, the whole thing with self-image is just like, it's how we perceive ourselves, And I found for myself, as I spoke about earlier on, it was really difficult being me because I always wanted to be someone else. I was never comfortable being me. And, you know, the world has, you know, this perception on how you're meant to look and how you're meant to talk and how you're meant to act and behave. But if you're truly clear on who you want to be, I know this is kind of a downer, but it's the truth. You have got to be willing to risk losing those friends and those people in your life in order to be who you are. Or you'll go through your entire life trying to fit in. You'll go through your entire life trying to be somebody and not. And you'll pass from this life to the next with one thought. I was always trying to be someone that I wasn't. And I never took the time to engage with that part of me that's unique and that's special. There's always going to be people out there that want you to act in a certain way and do a certain thing. But as I said earlier on, truly loving you means you can be who you want to be without my, you know, without me needing to get you to conform to my will. Um, and I think that's really, really important for, for folks as they're learning their self-image as well. Now, again, there's, there's a lot of obviously dynamics to that, but you know, that, that's in some ways what, what I would encourage anyone with. So I actually have a question Go for, it. for you. Um, I'm intrigued. <laughs> I, so as you were talking about talk, talking to, to teens and young yeah. adults and kind of explaining that this stuff happens. Um, it's the I, most I bizarre conversation ever <laughs> to have with a teenager, by the way. <laughs> I'm so that's kind of my question because I remember my mom and I maybe could, maybe it's different coming from a parent, uh -huh. but yes. my mom would tell me all these things and I'd be like, whatever, yeah. mom. like, yeah, okay, sure. Fine. I feel like so much of like what I went through personally, mm -hmm. and I do feel like a lot of teens go through this is like, this like, ah, eh, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't understand me. And like, <laughs> eventually you do get to a point where you're like, oh, no, they, they, they knew what they were talking about but like in your adolescence yeah. in your teen years like you just don't believe it and like I guess my question is like how do you help teens kind of understand it or maybe put it in a way that they go oh yeah I guess I guess that is true and 
because I just feel like there is this kind of like I I know what I'm doing like yep. I'm I'm a teenager I you know I, I'm gonna be different you know because I de- I know I definitely had that I was like I'm gonna be different I'm not gonna be like that and, you know <laughs> life is life and adults and people older they do know what they're talking about but I feel like you kind of have to go through the experience to to figure it out and yep. so I guess my my question is yeah how do you how do you almost skip that step of like you have to go through it to figure it out and get teens to kind of understand that? It, it's uh, it's actually a fairly simple thing because the way that I've always positioned myself with teenagers is almost like the role of a big brother. Um, and the way that I do it is, again, because I had the same thing, you know, my folks, um, I can't remember my dad ever a, having a conversation with me uh, regarding puberty or anything. Um, this is this would probably be for the, those that are listening. This is this is the strangest conversation we've ever had. <laughs> hey, it's all good. We, we, we look at all these things, folks. We talk about these because they're important. Um, but I do know of uh, a couple of different kids that used to come to our art school that were going maybe maybe they're ten years old, eleven years old, and they'd said, you know, my mom said I'm, you know, even you know weird things like getting bras and whatnot, and um, you know, which is the word that no guy's meant to talk about apparently. Um, but it, I was like. <laughs> okay, but I didn't make it a big deal. I didn't make it awkward. It was just like, yeah. okay, it's just a natural part of life. And, you know, you grow up. And but I set myself up more as the, the you know, the the guide in any um, in any youth group that I went into. I was more the, the fun person. And, and you know, I, I would be more the big brother where you could have those weird conversations and not have someone recoil. Um, yeah. And that's just the way that I've really always run my, you know, kind of my, my own dharma, my own, you know, reason for being. Um, and I think when teenagers found with me that you could have these conversations and yes, this guy, when I was, you know, in ministry and things, he would teach you about Jesus, but he would also teach you about life skills and he'd teach you about this, that, and the other. And he was fine to throw a dodgeball at your head at 15 miles an hour. I didn't have a problem with that. It was great fun. Um, and I missed it. But, you know, I think that really helped then to have that conversation. The issue, yeah. I think, for a lot of parents, and I, I can't speak for having kids, but I can speak for working with them before we get any weird comments through saying, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, yeah. You know, is, is mainly because this is what a lot of parents have come back with. You know, my son or daughter is 15 years old um, or 14, whatever it is. And, you know, they're in their 30s, 40s, 50s. They don't know how to connect with them. Well, the simple way is because it's like three different generations, you know, in, in age. And oftentimes parents expect their kids to be interested in the same things that they're interested in. I know mine certainly was. Um, so it, it, that does cause that void. Whereas I just decided I want to be interested in what games they're playing, what films they're watching, what music they're listening to. And I, di- I quickly discovered when I was listening to the Foo Fighters and I was listening to, you know, uh, Corn and Limp Biscuit and Linkin Park and all these other bands that these kids were now listening to. And the fact that they love 70s and 80s music, I'm like, guys, <laughs> let's just sit and talk about this music show, you know, that is straight to Mark Knopfler. Wow. Okay. And they'd never heard of him. So I put Mark Knopfler on the, this guy's amazing. One of the best guitarists in the world after Slash um, from Guns N' Roses. Oh opinion. yes. Oh yeah. I mean, Slash is phenomenal. Um, <sighs> but Mark Knopfler had a very, very different way of doing that. But when you can start interacting with them yeah. and if you can do it on one thing, and then you start talking about games, you start talking about TV shows that they really like. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, this guy's maybe, you know, really, really cool because he's able to do that. I didn't need to be this, you know, legalistic religious figure because there's enough of those around. I just need to be a guy that was able to be a guide um, to these kids. And that was the first step in doing it. So as, you know, three months in when they were saying, you know, and they're finding their own sexuality and they're going through a whole host of troubles, you know, yes, it was weird and it was uncomfortable because it was the first time I'd ever experienced someone saying to me openly, I'm bisexual or I'm lesbian or I'm, I'm transgender or whatever it is. Um, it was, and I'll be honest, it was really strange for me because I'd never encountered that before. Um, yeah. But being able to, and, and I hold my hands up, I did not make the best responses and best decisions at that point. Now, you know, six years on, I would make completely different responses. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a whole other topic. But for when kids, when they're able to say, you know, I'm going through this, um, you know, and, and to be okay and comfortable in talking about it, you know, I was like, okay, you know, it's no big deal. You know, <laughs> yeah. I got my first brow today. It's like, okay, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, cool. you, know? <laughs> so. you know what? That's a really good point that you make. It's it's about, um, I, I think that a lot of the things that like 
you know, you talk with your parents or mentors or, or yeah. people, there is this kind of like taboo yeah. quality of like, okay, we're going to talk about it, but we can't really talk about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you're right. It, it is kind of like <clears throat> almost desensitizing yeah. against these things. And, and you know what? I'll give our culture a lot of credit because when it comes to sexuality, mm -hmm. and I feel like we could have an entire episode yeah. dedicated Absolutely. to that. And I think that's a good idea. Um, but it's becoming way more accepted. And mm -hmm. the way that we talk about it is a lot more normal. And yeah. I, and I feel like what you just, and how you answered is exactly the reason yeah. for this series. It's, it's bridging that gap because, you know, I know I couldn't talk to my parents mm -hmm. and a lot of times, and especially now in this COVID ridden world, you can't just like go down to your church yeah. or your youth center or wherever you go and get this kind of mentorship, yeah. this type of big brother, I'm going to help you out through life um, kind of relationship. And so obviously the internet has filled that void sometimes for good and bad. And I think that that is exactly why we are here because yeah. you and I went through that. And we don't want to see, we don't, I mean, when we have this, the, the tools, we should, you know, if you, can, you don't have to go through it, if you, we can ease it a little bit. Yeah. It, it's helpful. And I think as well, you know, when you're able to talk about it, you know, with a sense of humor and a sense of dignity, realizing that it's not taboo. I mean, I've said to kids before, um, you know, and, and there were some major challenges for sure when I've had to say to kids, um, you know, I, I'm happy for you to talk to me, but you've got to know if this is a child protection issue, I will need to report this. So think very clearly about what you're going to tell yeah. me. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the, one of the things actually, I know we, we will talk about this because I, I agree, I think it's a really important topic to, to, to cover, especially in today's culture, um, certainly in the UK. Now, I'm, I'm happy that people are being able to talk a lot more for sure. What I have a major concern about for kids in school in particular, and it's primary school, so what elementary school maybe for you guys, mm -hmm. um, yeah. is the amount of what I would call sexual content that's taught to them. Because what happens is children, even as young as five and six years old, are coming, you know, and are so confused with so many things that's going on. And they're reaching, you know, and again, I firmly believe that, you know, thoughts do become things. And the more you focus on something, mm -hmm. the more that, you know, you essentially become that thing. The issue, I think, for a lot of folks now, and as a psychologist that I'm challenging is, is this a person's, you know, or, or is this difficulty a person going through a result of their sexuality or is it a result of their psychology? And they're two different things. And I think doctors yeah. now are far too quick just to either hand out medication or just to oh. say, you know, right, we'll just do a sex change operation for you because the amount of people now, and I don't have the stats in front of me. If Katie was here, she'd probably be able to tell you. Um, but the amount of people that are having the reverse, there is a name for it, and I can't think of what it's called, but the reverse of a transsexual op operation, that's a heck of a mouthful, um, is staggering. So they're getting yeah. these operations sometimes when they're 14, 15 years old, and by the time they're 19 years old, they're getting them undone. But as, as we've said on other shows, that you know that does something psychologically to a person and that's something I think that really does need to be addressed because, you know, it's um, it, it's it's a major issue of concern, certainly for me. And if I was yeah. to have kids, then um, I think I'd be very uncomfortable to have that in, in school. I completely agree. And, and definitely this is something I think we can definitely do definitely. an entire episode on because I know I have a lot of feelings about it, too. And, yep. and actually, that's a great point because um, I so I'm in a. I'm in a relationship with somebody who has, who has a, a son. Mm -hmm. He's, um, he's older and he's going through a lot of things. Yeah. And I, I sometimes worry, you know, is this a, is this just like so much inundation from our culture yeah. that it's confusing? And I agree that like, those are not the years to be making these big Correct. decisions. Yeah. And so I think it's such a double-edged sword because part yeah. of you, you know, you really want to be open and receptive mm -hmm. and, and, you know, understanding of people's feelings, sexuality, yeah. whatever, yeah. but you also don't want to cause trauma yeah. where there, where it could be avoided. And so I think the, the best thing that we can do it for, 
anybody in that kind of a situation, especially in their teen years. And honestly, I think well into your twenties, like you really just don't even know where, where you stand is to just kind of be supportive. And like, it's like, don't make any rash decisions, but you know, if you're feeling this way, that's okay. Let's explore it. Let's talk about it a little bit. Um, Because I feel like sometimes when you start diving deeper, it's it's more of a surface thing right. and it's not really yeah. a deep thing. And that all feeds right back into a self-image of like, yeah. you think you're this and then, you know, in two years, you could be something completely different. I know yeah. that when I was 15, 15 to 19, uh, two completely different people. And then 19 to 25 to yeah. 27, I mean, it's a huge, huge changes. So I I just think we need to start putting the emphasis more on like, conversations yeah. and talking about it like get rid of this act and then think yeah. <laughs> it's like think yeah. before we act because you are, we're gonna we're gonna avoid a lot of trauma I think and that's one of the things that we do with our teen life coaching um is you know again someone will say to me well I'm feeling this way I'm feeling that way and I'm like okay that's just the surface and they kind of look at you like what And then it's my job to get to the root cause. And the root cause is usually one of a few things. And when you start getting to the root cause, um, you know, it it makes a lot of sense. Now, I can't speak for everybody. I can only speak from my own experience. And this is what I'm going to do, because I have known three people specifically um, that went through uh, or are going through the process of transgender. And I know we won't spend too much time on this because I know this is, you know, we, we can cover this in another topic. Um, but I know that we, you know, they're going through that process and I know them very, very well. I've been friends with them for a very long time. And when this came out and you saw how they changed personality wise and all this other stuff. And then I started thinking you know, a little bit more and I started talking about talking with them a little bit more and having that conversation as to, you know, what is it that you're going through here? And one of them in particular said, you know, it was so painful for them to be female that they felt they had to be a guy. Now to me, now I know the operation that obviously from guy, no, from girl to guy and how painful it is, what it inquire, you know, in, in, you know uh, what takes part in everything. It is excruciatingly painful. Now, in my mind, I'm like, okay, that's where you're feeling right now. I, as a you know, psychologist in training, would then say, let's do a little bit of work together from a mindset point of view to dig a bit deeper, because to me, it sounds more like a, a psychological point of view and, and things like that. Now, I know there are a lot of people that are going through that. I can only express my own opinion with the information I know as of this time. 10 years from now, I may know, and I will know a lot more about it. Um, but I just think, you know, like you were saying, Alicia, that it's important to get to kind of the root cause before we start acting and giving people pills and these, you know, DNA changing drugs that they're trying to, to put into folks now. Um, and I think that's really important. So, but that's a topic for another time. So. Yeah. And actually just talking about, about that too. And I think this could also be another topic is, is pill pushing. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, that, like that's, in, that's a phenomenal one. That one yes. And, and like in young kids, yep. it's, it's mind blowing, but yeah, I think that's going to be in a completely other topic because I definitely didn't have that experience, but I, I watched people mm-hmm. go through that experience. And as a young kid, it is traumatizing. Yes. Like my partner, he, he, ref- he sometimes refuses to take like Tylenol mm-hmm. because of like experiences that he had yep. younger in his life. Um, which then all goes back to your self image and how you look at yourself. And even he's in his forties now. And he's like, I am still figuring out things that have happened in my past and how I, how I'm dealing with them. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of topics that we could be covering. I'm taking all the notes. And I love that. that We can do. (laughs) (laughs) I can actually write that one down really quick. But it's true. And, you know, and that's why folks, just while Alicia's writing this bit down, um, I'll segue a little bit because it's that's why it's so important to be very much aware of our thoughts and, you know, the actions that we do, because you can spend your entire life recovering from a decision you made 25 years ago. And some people do. So anyway, she's back. So Alicia, you can take over. Um, I think the I just want to ask the question again, because we talked about a lot of stuff and I feel like our answers can be completely different, but I think I want to wrap it, this topic up with, 
Um, what would your suggestions be for people who are either struggling with the fear of failure mm -hmm. or having failed and dealing with those feelings going forward? What, what would be your suggestion, your advice? Okay, so the first thing is um, for people that are afraid to fail, um, first of all, as a, hopefully I can encourage you with, we never fail. We just produce results. And it's important that you learn the lessons from the results. We've still got sometimes people in their you know, 50s and 60s that are going around the same set of circumstances over and over and over again because they, uh, they, they haven't learned how to learn the lessons. Each thing comes with a lesson. And sometimes when you fall flat on your face, you're like, okay, I need to pick myself back up. And you either keep walking or you stay on your face. Um, when you fall off a bike, you don't fail at riding a bike, you learn how not to fall off a bike. And hopefully you learn it very, very quickly. Otherwise, it's very painful. Um, so this is why it's really important, again, to remember, because fear literally is the thing that can stop you from doing something, you know, that you want to do. And oftentimes, we're afraid for a different variety of reasons. If it's going into business, for example, and working for yourself, we're often afraid because we're like, what about if it doesn't work? What if it does? What if, you know, I don't know enough? There are a ton of free audiobooks on YouTube. I am now at 165 since January. I listen to them. <laughs> I probably listen to four books a day. My goal is actually to listen to 2,000 in a year um, um, because the knowledge then that that puts into my head that I can teach obviously is phenomenal. That also means that increases my value in the marketplace for what we're doing with Teenage Life Coaching. See, everything rolls back around. Yep. Yep. So that would be my advice is remember that you can never, ever, ever fail. You just produce results and it's what you do with the results that's going to make the difference. Um, if you feel that you have failed, if you've tried something, let, let, let's, let's rephrase it. If you've tried something and it hasn't worked, try something else. You know, if you've tried mm -hmm. to build the clock and you've built, you know, a, a skyscraper, <laughs> then, then you need to figure out how the heck to build a clock. You know, it's sometimes you need a little bit more knowledge, a little bit more experience. Um, it's also about how you talk to yourself as well. And this is more probably about self-esteem and how, you know, the messages that we talk to each other. I think we covered this last week that, you know, when we, we often say, you know, and, and human beings will say, well, I'm not that good at something. Stop saying that. The first mm -hmm. thing that you need to be able to say is I haven't learned that skill yet. Now, I know you might say, oh, John, this just sounds stupid. It will change your attitude and your attitude towards something is what's going to determine, do you try it again or do you not? And you can say, well, I've tried it once. It doesn't work. Well, big what? Again, you know, Emma's, uh, or, um, Edison, you know, tried making a light bulb, you know, 999 times before he figured out how to do it. Um, now, whether that's, you know, accurate or not, it doesn't matter. The point is he kept trying and trying and trying and trying. You know, there was a story I heard the other day about ants. If you put a boulder in front of an ant and they haven't got a, a, a way to get through or past or whatever, they will work literally until they decay and de de you know depart this world at getting over, around, under, through. They work together. They try and figure every single conceivable way out of getting around that boulder. And again, that's what we need to be able to do. And when you fail sometimes, folks, I know, hey, it sucks. There's times that you build yourself up. You think this is going to be the big one. This is going to be the big product launch. And you maybe get two people. Uh, Laurie, who was on the um, call with me the other day, you know, she had um, her and her business partner, I don't think she'd mind me sharing this, but her and her business partner years ago had set up this life coaching session and they spent, you know, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to get this set up. And they only had 30 people that turned up. Now we're talking about the best life coaches, you know, you know, the top life coaches that are out there. But she learned then how to be a life coach. She set up another business with her partner and, and moved, you know, into a place where she made all that money back and more, paid off all the debt, and there you go. Sometimes these lessons are costly, but you know, we've got to be able to learn from the lessons and just don't be afraid to really try. Because at the end of the day, everybody can succeed at trying nothing. But those yeah. that try something, you may just be able to develop and build your dreams. Remember, I started off no different from you, and you started no different from me. I've just made the decision to educate myself each and every single day. And that's what I teach not only our team, but also the people that I work with. People even that I talk to for free and say, well, I want to be here. I'm like, how are you educating yourself? 
you know, listen, 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 develop. I struggle with my eyes. So for years, I didn't learn that much because of dyspraxia, which affects my eyes and I struggle with reading. But I found a way now to listen to 165 books in three and a bit months. You know, it is possible to do this. You yeah. just got to figure it out. Um, and the final thing I would say is, you know, be aware of your thoughts. It's really important. Thoughts do become things. They will either hinder you, help you or hurt you in your life. And when you really um, can develop your thoughts and learn wisdom, that's the greatest gift you can give yourself is wisdom and experience. And that is how you actually contribute to the economic marketplace and everything else. So hopefully that was helpful. That was, yes, very. Um... I, I completely agree with everything that you said. And actually the, the one thing that I do want to just kind of throw in there yep. too is this is a skill my mom, I'm going to, I'm going to reference my mom so much. <laughs> She's going to be like, oh, Alicia. Um, but one thing that she always told me, because I'm an emotional person when I fail, right. I'm the type that I, I, I want to go hide under my blankets. Yeah. I just want to stay there all day and I don't want to do anything. And one of the best things that she taught me was fine, go ahead. Yeah. But tomorrow you're going to get up and you're going to figure it out and you're going to keep going, have your little pity party, be sad, be upset, get it all out yeah, and then move on. And I really, I honestly think that that is so therapeutic just for yourself. Give yourself that space. Yeah. Give yourself the space to feel bad because humans have a, a range of emotions mm. we are going to feel that way and i feel like so much of the time we're told not to feel this way not to feel that way yeah. feel this way and that is i feel more detrimental sometimes yeah. than anything else so give yourself the space sometimes to let the feelings be there but definitely it's 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 the what you do after that yes that yeah. is the big thing it's okay to feel bad. It's okay to feel upset. It's okay to be angry, mad, pissed off, whatever the feeling is you're feeling, it's fine. <laughs> but yeah, and the next day, figure out how to make it better. And, and actually, um, whatever, you know, disability, and actually, it's funny that you mentioned a disability because I have dyslexia. Right. So I have a hard time reading too for, for different reasons, but that was always a struggle for me. And so, but the, the world that we live in now with the internet is, is so insane. It's like you said, you, you listen to audiobooks now and that's yeah. how you got around your, your problem. And there, there's just such a wealth of knowledge out there yeah. now. And there's so much accessibility to it. And there's always a way to, to learn and to keep going. So, yeah. Absolutely. And, and the whole thing is, guys, you know, if, if you are serious about yourself and who you are and, and wanting to develop, there is literally nothing that can stop you, you know, yes. and you just keep finding different ways over and over and over again. You know, um, you know, I, I always liken it to certain uh, creatures that survived after the meteorite that wiped out the dinosaurs. <laughs> there were certain ones that survived, you know, like these little rat like creatures. You know, oftentimes, you know, the squirrel, for example, looks and it's only got one goal in mind, getting the nuts. Its focus is on the nuts. It's not on all these different things that are going on. And sometimes you've just got to keep on focused. And yeah. like Alicia was saying, you know, you, you express your emotion in whatever way you have. Like I, I work very differently these days to what I used to do. I used to get really annoyed uh, beyond belief. My anger was off the charts before I really got this under control. Um, you know, and for me, what I find now, if, if something doesn't go right or if it doesn't go according to plan, as it did on, on uh, Saturday night, I, I just give you guys an, in, <laughs> or, or an insight. We did the uh, first ever teen life coaching um, session and I'm doing the intro and I'm flying and I'm doing all this. And then I literally, I breathed out and it was like all my energy just gone from out of me. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I know I'm meant to be talking about something now. And it was like this out of body experience. My, my mouth was going <laughs> And I'm talking about what I'm meant to be, but it was just like, oh boy, you know, and I was like, I feel that I have zoomed <laughs> off into the land of unknown with this one. And Laurie's like, no, that sounded great because you tell great stories and things. And I'm like, it's just as well that I know how to tell stories so no one knows when John's just off in la la la, and, you know, 
Um, and then I come back in and I'm looking down the side and I'm thinking about all the recordings and all these different things. And I'm watching Laurie's notes. I'm watching my notes and I'm like, oh, I'm due. I'm speaking about this. Um, <laughs> and then my brain, I was like, just stick to the notes, <laughs> stick to yeah. the scripts. Yeah. I was like, oh yeah, there's a script. Here I go. <laughs> yeah. I feel, I feel that a lot. I'm, I, I feel like I tangent frequently. <laughs> Oh, I think we did that today, to be fair, but it was a great, Yeah, I great, was just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, the one thing that I, I want to, I want to put out a challenge, if that's okay. Yeah, um, I don't know about this, trying, folks, so whatever happens, happens. Go for it. I, I've been starting to do this a little bit on my own personal, like, social media platforms, um, but I've been challenging people to just, like, do some, do one thing that really just makes you happy don't think about anybody else because i feel like a lot of times i go through my days constantly just like focus on everybody else everything else and i never have time i have books that i, have, I haven't touched in years i have paintings that i haven't touched i have i have one thing that you will learn about me is i'm a puzzle fanatic Ooh. i love a good puzzle <laughs> actually i have like several set up in my <laughs> office right now but take Take 20 minutes out of your day. Even if, okay, even if you can do like five, take time today, tomorrow, wherever you have time, do something just for you. If you have to tell your husband, your wife, your partner, your kids, I just need 10, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go do this thing and then I'll be right back. Honestly, that sometimes is such a recharge. Yeah. And, and I think that too, kind of feeding back into today's theme of like self-image um, sometimes taking that time just for yourself. Um, and actually I would, I would even say, put the phone down. Yeah. D don't, don't be on the phone, do something non-phone related. Um, I think you learn a lot about yourself when you're just kind of sitting there, like doing something that you truly love and enjoy. And you have time to kind of just reflect on that. I think that is, is a big way that I know I help it helped me to kind of figure out who I was so my challenge to everybody watching take anywhere from five to 20 minutes today and just kind of do something just for you I think that's fantastic it's great advice <laughs> you know it, that's actually something that I cover in my other book that I'm writing at the moment <laughs> because it is all about balance it's really really important and uh, we weren't it's a slippery slope to be, too well that's it you know and, it, and it's you know it, it's it's the whole thing that we weren't designed just to be work, 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 work all the time. You know, there has to be that balance that's there and it's, it's essential for everything that we do. So. Yeah. so is there anything you want to cover before we wrap up for today? I think that was it for me. Yeah. It sounds good. It sounds good. Well, guys, you got an amazing, really, really packed show today. <laughs> we really hope you enjoyed it. I I know it was extended. I know we had a tremendous amount of fun, but don't forget again to like, share and subscribe, do all that good stuff, tell a friend because it could be the very thing that they need to hear. You know, and again, when you're listening to these shows, we don't know what's coming out half the time. We've got, <laughs> we've got ideas and things, but we'll segue into other things. So it's really awesome to listen to the full show. If you're interested in teen life coaching folks and supporting the show, you can get in touch with us at patreon.com forward slash mind, body, and soul. You can also get in touch with us at thebattlesweallface.com. Uh, we've got some brand new courses up there, and we'll be sharing more about that next week. Um, we'll be telling you some of the courses that are up there, um, some really awesome self-improvement courses that's going to help you guys in a major way. And uh, from Alicia and myself, have an amazing week. Take care. God bless. And we will see you soon. Take care. Bye, everybody. <laughs>